saying that, they thought I was saying that the more mineralization, the more likely it's malignant. No, the more mineralization, that's benign, because the benign cells can form, produce more of the normal cellular functions compared to the malignant cells. I agree. Okay, round cell tumors. All right, the blue round cell tumors we will uh, take off on here. So we're going to be talking about uh, Ewing sarcoma, lymphoma, small cell carcinoma, small cell osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, neuroblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma. I don't know if you want to say anything else about this slide here. But Other than we're not going to be discussing each of these individual elements, but just presenting the differential diagnosis of um, uh, primary and metastatic malignant round cell uh, tumors. So Ewing sarcoma was first uh, uh, delineated by uh, Professor Ewing um, back in uh, 1921. He actually called it diffuse endothelioma of bone at that time. So Ewing sarcoma occurs really in the first two decades of life. It's a little bit younger than osteosarcoma. Uh, rarely do you see Ewing sarcoma above the age of 30. Um, it's very uncommon in the black population. Um, just like osteosarcoma, you get localized pain and swelling. What's a little bit different is that you see a significant uh, increase in uh, fevers and malaria and um, more inflammatory, almost infectious type symptoms with Ewing sarcoma, which you don't normally see with osteosarcoma. Um, also with Ewing sarcoma, more commonly you see with multiple bone uh, metastasis uh, of Ewing sarcoma, and that's why we do bone marrow aspirations for these uh, tumors. But again, they occur more commonly in long bones. Ewing's will occur a little bit more commonly in the pelvis. So the clinical features, we see pain and swelling. Ewing sarcoma seem to grow these very large soft tissue masses very rapidly. In general, you'll see a larger soft tissue mass with Ewing sarcoma. You'll also see elevation with sed rate because it gets more inflammatory uh, picture when you uh, make the diagnosis. And here's this classic what people like to see, onion skinning, broken periosteal reaction lines of a Ewing sarcoma. So 60% um, involve the long bones. They are more common in the diaphysis, which most of your other malignant tumors, malignant bone tumors are co more common in the metaphysis. Ewing's is a permeative bone destruction. You can see it's very hard to delineate where the tumor starts and stops. It's a very poorly marginated tumor. Again, you see the onion skinning, large soft tissue mass uh, of these uh, lesions. Here's a classic, I think is a classic Ewing sarcoma. Here's a two-year-old child. You can see the, um, the permeative appearance in the bone, the onion skinning, the broken periosteal reaction line, and this large soft tissue mass uh, in a child. This was an obvious Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma also occurs more commonly in the flat bones than osteosarcoma. And here you see a large Ewing sarcoma of the scapula. Here's an example of a Ewing sarcoma, the diaphysis. You can see this very large soft tissue mass um, and uh, this permeative appearance. When you look at the bone there, you, you really can't tell where this tumor starts and stops. It's permeating rapidly uh, through the bone. There are a variety of different um, mm. molecular abnormalities that have been described in Ewing sarcoma. The single most common is a translocation involving chromosomes 11, 22. But notice that there can be different partners uh, uh, other than the uh, EWS gene or the FLY1 gene, which is located on chromosome 11. So uh, significant percentage, 11, 22, but there's 21, 22, 7, 22, 17, 22, really distinguishing the translocation partners currently does not alter uh, anything with regards to the treatment of uh, the patients. This just highlights one thing, that the EWS gene, which is translocated in Ewing sarcoma, can also be translocated in other different types of both uh, primary bone and soft tissue, uh, 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 benign and malignant tumors. So the translocation or derangement of chromosome 22 not diagnostic of, but characteristic of Ewing sarcoma. By the time we receive the specimens, Ewing sarcomas, again, 
relatively large tumors, greater than 10 centimeters at the time of diagnosis. They are fish flesh-like in appearance, destroying the medullary cavity, eroding the cortex, extending into the soft tissues. This is an example of Ewing sarcoma uh, that's developed in the rib. This is costal cartilage. You can see how the underlying bone has been digested, uh, tumor extending out into uh, the soft tissues, lifting up the periosteum. In this instance, producing in some areas a sunburst pattern of reactive periosteal new bone formation. Low power Ewing sarcoma growing with an infiltrative pattern within the cortex, lifting up the periosteum here, and this is tumor percolating through periosteal new bone formation. Classic Ewing sarcoma, malignant round cell tumor, one to two times the diameters of a red blood cell, very little cytoplasm nuclei that have very fine uh, chromatin. We've talked a lot about the translocations. Again, the characteristic one, 1122, where portions of each of the chromosomes are exchanged, producing an abnormal uh, gene with the EWS and FLY1 components next to each other, uh, uh, producing eventually a chimeric protein uh, that uh, changes the genetic expression. This was just the list that we showed before of the different types of tumors that can have arrangements of chromosome uh, uh, 22. And this is just more molecular information showing how gene expression arrays are able to distinguish rather clearly Ewing sarcoma from tumors some, such as lymphoma versus rhabdomyosarcoma versus neuroblastoma, just based on the different genetic profiles of those individual tumors. So treatment of Ewing sarcoma, uh, again, it's neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, by wide resection. Certainly these, pa these tumors are much more sensitive to radiation than osteosarcoma. That usually was the classical way to treat. But more and more evidence supports that in the extremities, you should be resecting these and not radiating these. I think there's some question in the pelvis what we should be doing, but for the extremities, we certainly um, should be doing uh, chemotherapy and surgery uh, and preserve radiation for the unresectable uh, tumors or the more difficult to resect tumors. This is just an example of a pelvic uh, Ewing's in a child. Um, and you can see this large resection that was done uh, for this Ewing sarcoma. The prognosis of this Ewing sarcoma in a child is less than a 20% five-year survival. And there's no difference between radiation and resection for five-year survival. And look at the post-operative complications and the disability of this child. And I think that more often, the pelvic Ewing's, we might should be considering radiation unless you can do a resection with minimal disability, which is a hard thing to do in the pelvis. When you look at the treatment changes over the years uh, with chemotherapy and the treatment of uh, Ewing sarcoma, it's interesting that it wasn't until right around the 1970s before we started seeing a overall change in the survival. Survival rate was under 10% prior to that time. And um, then uh, right about that time, vincristine uh, and actinomycin came in, actinomycin D, um, in the late 60s, early 70s, and we started seeing the increase in survival of Ewing sarcoma. Prior to that time, it was just radiation uh, for the treatment of these. Then etoposide, ifosamide became more popular um, uh, drugs uh, in the development, and we started seeing a jump from the 20% uh, up to 50% uh, with the addition of etoposide and ifosamide. Um, about that time, bone marrow transplant became popular, um, and we started doing bone marrow transplant with the Ewings. And I think that for the very extensive bone metastasis uh, of Ewings, probably bone marrow transplant plays an important role. When you start combining the etoposide and ifosamide, the IE in combination, we start now getting survivalship um, up above 75%. Um, so you can see the changes that occurred during that time. I think more importantly, during that time, we figured out the genetics of this disease and we're gonna have more and more drugs specific to the genetics uh, as we move forward. Anything you wanna add? No. Okay, so 
This is just going to some of the new agents that we're trying to do with uh, Ewing sarcoma, especially with uh, recurrence. Uh, we're adding temozolomide, topotecan, uh, gemcitabine. All these seem to be uh, fairly effective. The new agents or the antibodies, the IGFIR, seems to be very important in mTOR. Um, and then we're getting into immunotherapy and specific uh, drugs for the translocation for the future and treatment of Ewing's. And again, the goal of all this type of therapy is to kill the tumor. What we're looking at is a resection specimen of the tibia. This is the Ewing sarcoma. Notice it looks different than the other growth specimens. It's yellow. This represents where tumor previously was occupied and has undergone necrosis. These are the dead ghost tumor cells. And in the end, what will happen to them are macrophages come phagocytize these cells leave behind a reactive fibrous scar. And again, greater than 90% necrosis is now really the reference we use to determine whether there's been a good response to systemic therapy or not, it requires a fair amount of uh, sampling on the pathology end. I'm gonna go one, back, uh, one more point on this. Uh, this is an important point. I know we've gone through a lot, but this is something I do want to stress because Ewing's is important for surgeons to understand this. Remember, we're talking about Ewing sarcoma commonly has these big, large, soft tissue masses. And with chemotherapy, you can see this necrosis like he's showing this picture here. But what do you treat? So my view of this thing is, is that for the soft tissue decision making, I use the post-chemotherapy MRI scans, what I'm going to resect. Because this soft tissue mass does not infiltrate the muscle, it grows from the bone and pushes the muscle up and away. So when the chemotherapy responds, as the tumor shrinks down, then the muscle comes back down. I don't resect how big the soft tissue mass was and try to resect all this muscle because it doesn't really infiltrate into the muscle for the most part. It pushes it. The bone is different. See, the bone, you see this extension up and down the bone. It's necrotic. But this is infiltrating within the marrow. So I always use my preoperative MRI scans to do my bone resection. I use my postoperative um, MRI scans uh, to do the soft tissue part of the resection. So I, I think it's the difference in how you need to plan things out because there's good evidence from the 